Today we're going to summarise uh, a little bit um, what we've talked about in the last seven weeks about God's grace. Um, so let's just stop and commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for your gift of grace. We thank you that grace is a gift of yourself, a gift of your presence, a gift of your power, a gift of your love at work in our lives. Lord, would our ability to know you and to walk with you be strengthened. Lord, may our eyes be opened even more uh, to the goodness of your grace, to the work of grace in our lives. Lord, I just pray that you might strengthen those today that are here that feel weary and worn down. God, would you be their sufficient grace. Lord, I pray for those who are unwell and needing your touch today, would you sustain them by your grace? And Lord, those who are seeking you and yet to find you, Lord, would you extend your grace to them so that they might be found by you? Lord, we just thank you for your love, for your goodness, and for being our amazing saviour. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, over the last seven weeks, as I mentioned, we've been looking at uh, different aspects of grace um, and sort of breaking grace down a little bit so that we can fully appreciate um, what God has been doing and what God and who God is. So we've been working through this series called The Way, The Truth and The Life, A Discipleship as a Journey of Grace. So as we think about life and we think about our relationship with God, it is a journey. And it's a journey that is meant to be about growth and it is a journey that's meant to be about relationship. And if you're interested in reading more in more depth of some of the content that we've touched on in this reading, there's a book by David A. Busick and you can um, speak to Pastor Adrian. He knows how to access uh, that book. Free. So the things that we have looked at about grace are just to refresh your memory, seeking grace, the grace that goes before and calls us into relationship with God and gives us the power and ability to receive God as our saviour. The second being saving grace, the actual work of God's grace saving us and bringing us into that relationship where there is no longer a barrier between God and us, but we walk with him in relationship. The third being sanctifying grace and the work of God in our lives as he shapes and changes us to be more and more like him, more and more like Christ, developing our character, shaping our behavior and our attitudes. The next is sustaining grace, that grace that sustains us in our walk with God, in our human experience of suffering, loss and pain, God's grace comes and meets the need. And sufficient grace, we learnt last week how grace is that God gives us enough grace, that he is the one who meets us in our weaknesses and with his strength, we become strong. So today, I just want to give you the opportunity to share about what God has been doing in your life. And as you've worked through this series and listen to some of the scriptures. I'm sure that there have been particular things that have really touched your heart or challenged you or just opened your mind more to different aspects of God's grace. So I just wonder if anyone would like to share something this morning. I just have a mic I can pass to you if you would like to share. Um, 
And I know it's always a little bit scary to talk in front of people, but you can sit in your seat and what you might share might just be a real encouragement to others. And also, it gives us an opportunity to praise God and to thank Him in worship. So if you're interested in sharing, yep, Jo. Um, so uh, the thing that really stood out to me was, was actually last week talking about sufficient grace. And um, Michelle shared about how God supplied manna for the people when they left Egypt. And it was just enough for each day. You couldn't gather too much so that it would sort it out for the rest of the week or the next day. Um, but it was just enough for that day. And um, comparing that to God's grace, it's enough for today. Um, don't worry about, you know, tomorrow or the next day or what's happening. God's grace is sufficient for today. And that was just a really refreshing thing for me to hear. Um, you know, there's there's always plenty of things going on and, oh, how's this going to work out? And I need to plan for that. And um, it can be overwhelming. But it was just uh, a refreshing reminder to hear uh, his grace is sufficient. I just need to rest in him today. So that, that was a, a huge encouragement to me. Thank you. Let's just pray and hold all those things to God. Father, we just thank you for the work that you have been doing amongst us. We thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, I thank you that we have developed an even greater picture of your goodness and grace in our lives. Lord, help us to allow that grace to continue to do its work in us. And Lord, would you empower us to share that grace, to be a witness of that grace, just simply sharing the story of what you have done and are doing in our lives right now. Lord, help us to remember to lean into and reach for your sustaining and sufficient grace and allow it to carry us in those hard times and allow it to turn our hearts to worship. Lord, we thank you that you are an amazing God. We thank you for your love and goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I was preparing for our service today, um, I wasn't going to preach a message. We were just going to share, but God put some things on my heart, um, this particular passage through the week and so I do have something to share with you and I'm going to try and keep it a little bit briefer um, but I think it in this message it kind of brings together some of what we've talked about in the last few weeks and I was just thinking about how we love rules you know, sometimes some of us don't love rules <laughs> some of us are people who like you get uh, in like a piece of furniture with instructions and you don't look at it. You just, you love to just work it out and you only look at it as a last resort. And then there's people who have to read every instruction and read it again and they love to be very precise. And so there's uh, those amongst us who love rules and there's those amongst us who prefer to have some kind of basic boundary but then um, kind of work it out as we go. But in some ways we love rules because in the sense that we have this very solid um, line about behavior, they guide us into doing what is right and good. As we think about rules, why we make up rules, normally this is what rules do, is they help guide us into what is right and good. And they keep us away from harm. So, so I think that either through the wisdom of God and we base um, our societal law on the Ten Commandments. And we also add to that in society as we learn about how things harm us. And so we've added to that rules and laws that help protect us and protect others. And we also use rules to measure our behaviour by them. So we can, we can look at a rule and then go, okay, so how am I measuring up? Am I following that rule? Am I doing what's right and good by others? Well, Jesus tells us this story in Matthew 12 where there's this conflict between the idea of the love of rules 
and what God wants us to know and understand about his grace. And you'll find this story in Matthew 12, 1 to 14. At the time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? So he's talking there about um, this story where David and his companions after a battle were starving and they went and ate this consecrated bread, which normally would be a no-go zone. This is bread consecrated to God and only lawful for the priests to eat as their portion of provision. And then the other, he, he brings in the story of how priests serve on the Sabbath, and that would be considered work. They're the ones that bring the offering and serve in the temple so that people might be united to God. They might be forgiven their sins and have a way to God. And so that is work on the Sabbath. But here Jesus points out that they are innocent. They're not under condemnation because they work on the Sabbath. And neither was David and his companions under condemnation because they ate this consecrated bread. Well, why is that? What is Jesus trying to get at? He goes on and says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And going from that place, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Then Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. So that he stretched it out and was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Well, two very interesting stories with the same point. Is Jesus the lawbreaker? And this is what the Pharisees were trying to get at. They were looking at what he and his disciples were doing and trying to say that someone who was innocent was guilty, that Jesus was under condemnation because he and his disciples they were husking the grain and eating it on the Sabbath. That was work. He was healing a man in the temple on the Sabbath. Healing was considered in their mind work. But Jesus points out something very interesting. He, he goes to this point that he's making. Sorry, I've just lost my slides. I'll go back. He goes to this point that he was making where he draws back on history and shows how God didn't condemn people in those situations. So what is it that makes what we do either right by the law or wrong by the law? Is Jesus the lawbreaker? Is he, is he deliberately rebelling and setting out to do the opposite of what was right before God? Well, that's, that doesn't quite match up, does it? He's saying also that there is something greater than the temple is here. He's pointing to himself as the one who carries the very presence of God, who is God. God is amongst them, the one who makes the rules. He is the law maker, and yet they're accusing him of being the law breaker. So what is going on? So first, I would suggest that rules are a poor measure of goodness and godliness. God's law is always right. 
and his ability to guide our morality and our behaviour is something we should always follow. But rules in and of themselves are poor measures of our particular personal goodness and godliness. So all that a rule can do is actually tell us what's right, but it doesn't actually tell us what's going on in our very heart. See, Jesus says here that it was not lawful for them to do certain things, and yet God was saying it was lawful. God was not condemning them. They were innocent before God. Something else was going on. You see, Jesus shows mercy. He meets the requirement of the law. He brings up the scripture that from the Old Testament that says, I, God says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he, Jesus challenges them on this point. He says, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent if you had known what they mean. So here he's saying that above the law that they had made and the law that they were following, there's a greater law, this law of mercy, not a law of sacrifice, not a law of having to make right over and over for our sins by giving up something in place of our offense to God. But he is saying that mercy is what is needed. See, Jesus says to them, the reason why this is, in verse 11, he says, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. What's his premise about how is it lawful to do these things, to eat and to work, to get grain for food, to serve as a priest in the temple, to rescue a sheep? Might be something we'd make an excuse for, but God says people are more valuable. The man with the withered hand, his need before God, God had mercy. God saw this man in need of healing. Would it be lawful to overlook that need to follow a rule, a man-made rule? You see, there's a problem when we love rules more than we love people. And we love rules more than we love God. You know how sometimes we hold to something instead of showing mercy? We say, oh, but this is what the Constitution says, this is what the rule is, this is the way we've always done it. But is that action merciful? Or is it just following a rule? There's times when you're really challenged because the situation before you calls for some deeper thinking, some wrestling about what is the right response here. It goes deeper than what the written law can give us guidance on. And how do we know what is the right thing to do? Well, Jesus helps us understand that. He says that it is lawful to do good. It is lawful to do, God, to do good on the Sabbath. It is lawful to do good in a situation where normally we might think it was wrong because God places people above rules. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the law maker, not the law breaker. He is the God who is merciful to his people, who meets the need that is before him. He's not the one who holds on to the rule and says, sorry, we were starting at six, we shut the door, you can't come in, you'll have to come back next week. We close the door at six, it's 6.01, you can't come in. He's not a God like that. He's a God who says, what's the merciful thing to do? Open the door. Let the person in. 
Rules in themselves contain no power, only the power we give them. You see, we can know even the law, do not murder, but how does that rule have, how does that law have power? Only if we do not murder, only if we allow it to guide our life, then it has power. But it's in and of itself, it has no power to make us moral or good or Christ-like. It is only when we follow it. It is only when we let that law, that guidance of God go deep into our life that it has power because we receive it in faith. And it's the same thing in that situation. Hungry people needing food. God's not going to follow the rule over the need. He's going to meet the need. He's a God who has real power, the power of mercy, the power of grace. In the book of Colossians, this is addressed in the church where there is this problems of judgment about how we do things and this issue of grace and rulemaking. In Colossians 2, 16 to 17, it says, therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are shadows of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. You see, we get caught up in judgment and we want to look at people's lives and go, oh, look what they're doing, that's so wrong. I don't think you should be doing that. I don't think God would be happy with that. But are we really in the place where we should make that judgment? Is there something deeper at work? Is this an opportunity for mercy? The reality, however, is found in Christ. That's what Jesus is saying when he says something greater than the temple is here. He is here. The one who is holy is amongst you. And if you allow him, he will make you holy as you walk with him. Colossians 2.23 in that same passage says, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom and their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh judge treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. You know, we can make up all sorts of rules about how to be moral people. And we see that in cultures where women are asked to cover their bodies completely. Even their eyes are obscured to remove temptation from men to look at women lustfully. But God would say to us that it lacks no value in restraining sensual indulgence because what are we thinking in our mind? It's not about what a person is wearing. It's about where our mind goes. It's about what we nurture in us. Do we nurture lustful thoughts or do we look at women as sisters? as people to respect, as equals. That's where the change happens, not in the rule of making women cover themselves, but in the heart where God is wanting to change us, to move from people who are rule makers to people who are merciful. You see, Jesus shows mercy in the face of opposition. You know, sometimes we can be in a situation and people will make us out to be wrong because we are choosing mercy over judgment. And they can make you feel like the smallest, most insignificant person in the room. They can make you feel like you're wrong and everyone else is right. You're the one who wants to let that person in at 601 but this is what the rule book says and we're all standing by it. But in your heart, you know God says, be merciful to that person. And maybe against all odds, you open the door because you cannot be the one to stand against what God's conviction is in your heart. And you step out and you do what's right. And then the flood of judgment comes on you because you're the lawbreaker the rule breaker. You didn't stay with the group. You didn't do what was expected, but you did the merciful thing. Jesus shows mercy in the face of opposition. In all that condemnation, in all that 
trickery and trying to make Jesus out to be the lawbreaker, Jesus goes ahead and does what is merciful. He says to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, was completely restored, just as sound of the other, as the other. But the Pharisees, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. They might kill the blasphemer, the rule breaker, but he was the law maker. He was the creator, the God who restores the broken to life. But they wanted to kill him. They didn't like that his mercy showed up their judgment. They didn't like feeling uncomfortable about someone being good in your presence when your heart was to condemn, was to close off to the needs of others. And here comes someone who steps out, who meets the need, and it makes the people who want to hold on to the rules feel bad. They feel uncomfortable. You see, grace is not a commodity we can measure like a rule, but it is a relationship we can nurture. It's not a commodity, because if it was a commodity, we could measure everything by grace and by law. But Jesus helps us see that it's deeper than that. It's a relationship with a God of mercy who guides us in the moment to do what is right, what is good, what is loving. It is nurtured in us by walking in relationship with God. We become merciful, grace-filled people. It's this picture of walking and resting. This picture of walking in the mercy, walking in the grace and the strength and the power of God and resting in it. Doing all that you can to do what is right and resting in God for the result. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 in the message Verse 2 says, Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Love like that. Be extravagant, not cautious. Should I do this thing or not? Be extravagant. Do it. God puts it on your heart to be the one that goes to the door, that helps the person in need, that stops on your busy way to notice the person who's crying and says, are you okay? Can I help you? Do you need something? Love like that. Be the one that notices, the one that's available to let his grace work in you. And finally, grace is the power of God's love at work in our lives. That's what it is. It's what we walk in and what we lean into and what we allow to grow is this powerful love at work in our lives. We've been talking about grace as a journey. It is leaning, learning, sorry, that should say, to love with God and like God. You see, we can't really love without God. We can love to a point, but there'll be a situation where our love doesn't go that far. We can't muster enough grace for that person, but God does. God loves them. God has the grace we need in that situation to show mercy. Paul writes it this way in 1 Corinthians. He talks about the different apostles that did the work in the church, but he says only God gives the increase. And that is the work of grace, is that we do the work of mercy, and yet we rest in the fact that God is the one who gives the increase. God is the one that brings the victory. God is the one that heals people's hearts, that saves and restores people. And again, just to refresh, God is not a commodity. Grace is not a commodity we can measure, but a relationship that we can nurture. I just want to leave you with the words of this song that 
Irene shared with us in our small group this week that meant a lot to her. And I think it's a great peace to leave our hearts on today as we look at this hymn, He Giveth More Grace. It says, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. Whatever you need today in your journey of grace, it is found in him. It is found in a merciful God who will keep walking with us and working with us to make us people of mercy and people who receive grace for the journey. Let's pray. God, we thank you that when we have exhausted our store of endurance and when we've reached the end of our hoarded resources, your full giving has only begun. God, as we come before you and sometimes all we see is our weakness and our failings, but God, you love us as we are and you call us into what you want us to become and you give us the ability to walk with you and to be that person by your strength. Lord, we know that the needs around our lives are so great, but God, would you help us to walk with you to know how to respond, but then rest in you to allow you to bring the outcome, the increase in the lives of those who need you. God, would we be faithful witnesses to your grace at work in our lives and carry your mercy with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.